Hello, once again, we're looking into God's Holy Word and doing studies in the book of Acts. We're going through Acts 22, and we're in the midst of Paul's testimony. Once again, we come today to verse 7, and we say at verse 7, it says, And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, what might be a good thing to step back and ask, why was Saul persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, why would anybody fight against the Lord Jesus Christ? Even many agnostic and atheist and otherwise unbelieving historians and moralists and ethicists have recognized that the Lord Jesus lived a beautiful life on earth. Uh, they've recognized that his was a life of lives, that there's uh, really an incomparable loveliness about how the Lord comported himself on the earth. The way he spoke, you know, the common people heard him gladly, Matthew chapter 7 says. And even those who were sent to arrest him come back empty-handed, and they say, never a man spake like this man. Uh, there were, of course, children that were attracted to him, that wanted to come and see him and be blessed by him. There were parents that brought their babies to him. There were other people of different walks of life, theologians like Nicodemus, a very wealthy, powerfully influential people like Joseph of Arimathea, collaborators with the government like Matthew the tax collector, and violent revolutionaries perhaps like uh, Simon Zelote, Simon the Zealot. So all these different kinds of people and more. Uh, a woman with a checkered past at the well in Sychar in John chapter 4. Or a paralyzed man at Bethesda in John 5. A blind man in John 9. A woman taken in adultery in John 8. And uh, the men with the paralyzed friend in Mark 2 who lowered him before the Lord also in Matthew 9. All these sorts of people, lepers, lame people, blind, deaf, mute, coming to the Lord Jesus and finding in him a beauty, a kindness, a compassion, a really divine mercy being extended to them. And even his enemies had to concede, like Pilate, I find no fault in him, and neither did Herod, he said. Even those who were trying to find something regarding the Lord Jesus that was wrong couldn't really find a legitimate crime. There was no sexual scandal. There was no financial malfeasance. There was no corruption in the Lord Jesus. There was no sin whatsoever, great nor small. His was a life of altogether loveliness, of beauty. And you could look at that life even today, and you could admire it. The way that Mohandas Gandhi, himself a Hindu and not a Christian, and yet he said, I like their Christ, but I do not like their Christian. He had seen a lot of hypocrisy among people claiming the name of Christ. He had seen a lot of professing Christians acting and living in an unchristlike manner. Well, any Christian is capable of falling into that, and God preserve us from it. May we keep close to the Lord and lean hard on Him. But one thing is, for all the people that are skeptics and critics and that have attacked and even today, attack the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've still never been able to find anything wrong with him. The Lord Jesus asked almost 2,000 years ago, which one of you convicts me of sin? And that question still goes unanswered. That rhetorical declaration of our Lord hasn't found any kind of credible suggestion. Nobody has dug up any skeletons in our Lord's closet or found anything that he swept under the rug. There was no sin that the Lord committed, and he lived this absolutely beautiful life. So again, you might ask, well, why were you persecuting Jesus? Why would people oppose him and his teaching? I mean, everybody that came and bowed the knee to him and were saved, everyone whose lives he changed, they went from being, you know, corrupt people like Zacchaeus, the master tax collector who ruled over many other tax collectors and he was so utterly changed that he paid restitution to the people he had robbed uh, people that were violent like the thief on the cross who said lord remember me today when you come into your kingdom and he said assuredly i say unto thee today thou shalt be with me in paradise 
So people were changed. People that were before out of control, like the Gadarene demoniacs. These men were made at peace with God and with their fellow man. And fallen women, uh, like the woman who was a sinner that is in the Gospel of Luke and comes and wipes the Lord's feet with her tears and her hair. And yet she's transformed by the grace of God. And so is Mary Magdalene, out of whom the Lord cast seven devils. And so are many other people in the New Testament. Why then persecute him? Well, there's various reasons, but of course there's a spiritual battle behind it. Satan hates the Lord Jesus and wants to oppose him. And Satan has always had his seed, people that are his descendants in the sense that they oppose the seed of the woman. They oppose the Lord's Christ who was coming into the world. And they fought against the Lord's people through the ages and continue to do so. And so we have opposition to the Lord Jesus on that satanic and spiritual level. But as far as a religious man like Saul, why would he have any problem with the Lord Jesus? And it's simply the fact that Saul was going about to establish his own righteousness, as he says in Philippians 3. He was trying to cultivate the image of being a perfectly righteous man, of being a religious man so serious so committed to Judaism, so committed to the faith of his fathers that he could earn his way to heaven uh, based on his own merit, based on his own righteousness. And he finally found he had to give that away. He had to eschew his own righteousness and cast it aside that I may win Christ, he says. His opinion of the Lord Jesus would so utterly change and he would be converted and he would see in Christ the beauty. He would say, in fact, in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Or as a missionary I knew paraphrased it, for me to live is Christ and to die is more of the same. So he wanted Christ first, Christ second, Christ last. Christ, 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 and more Christ. That's what Paul would say. Give me the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what a believer has in their heart. They want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death, as Paul said in Philippians 3.10. That's what we want. More about Jesus, what I learn, more of his holy will discern, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. Yes, that's what we want. We want more of him. Not ourselves, but him. We want to talk about the Lord Jesus. We want to think about the Lord Jesus. The church meetings are to be centered around the Lord Jesus. The focal point every Lord's Day of coming around the symbols he left us. Bread that speaks of the body that he laid down in sacrifice. The death he died to redeem us and make us his people. And the cup, which is the blood of the new covenant. A symbol of that blood that was shed on Calvary. When the Lord laid himself down as a sacrifice there, he bought us to be his people and inaugurated with us the new covenant. And of course, it's going to have a future um, fulfillment with Israel. But even now, in this church age, Jew and Gentile made one body in Christ are entered into that. And we can say God is our God and we are his people. We know him personally. We don't just know about him. We haven't just heard of him. We know him. We've had a personal encounter with the risen Christ because we've believed on him in the word of God. We've met him in the pages of the Bible, and in the living way that he does, the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord, speaks through his written word, and we've heard his voice and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what would happen to Paul, of course. And you know, when he heard this voice from heaven, it was evident that it must be God speaking. And so he hears this voice, and accompanied by the bright light as it was, he could think about God. He would later say about God that he dwells in light which no man can approach to. And he knew something about God's light. But he asked the question here, who are you, Lord? And imagine the shock when the answer comes back. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. So this is the glorified son of God, who was son of man as well. The Messiah who had come from God to save. And Paul was all wrong about him. He thought to do many things against the name of the Lord Jesus. He thought to efface that name from the earth, to wipe it out and expunge it 
from the record of his times. But he found out that he was fighting against God. He found out that the very Son of God was the one calling to him in love and speaking to him and the one who would transform him. So he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now what a convicting word. Talk about being caught red-handed or caught in the act. He was in the very act of persecuting the Lord Jesus when the Lord Jesus met him. This is the beautiful thing about uh, God and how he saves people. He doesn't wait till we forsake our sins and get better. He doesn't wait till we clean up our act. He doesn't wait till we self-reform, as it were. He says, come to me in your sin, and I'll transform you. I'll save you from your sin. I'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. You can't save yourself. You can't improve yourself. You can do some superficial outward change, and you might even be able to delude yourself into thinking that you're a better person. But deep down, as long as we're relying on ourselves, we're denying our Creator. We're denying the Redeemer. We're denying that the Lord Jesus loved us and gave himself for us on the cross. And we're refusing to bow to his authority, refusing to call him Lord and to ask him to do what we need so badly to save us and make us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can be born again by his spirit through the word of God. A wonderful salvation, though, that even the persecutor, even the person that's doing something utterly wretched, something so violent, something so harmful and hurtful to many people, and here he's doing this against the Lord, and the Lord doesn't, as it were, say, well, this is such a bad sin, you can't be forgiven. This is an impediment to you entering heaven that cannot be removed. Such an obstacle to your salvation, because you've persecuted the very Christ. Now, it's interesting that the Lord says, why are you persecuting me? Because one could say, well, we don't have evidence that Saul met the Lord Jesus on earth. This was their first meeting, as far as the Bible tells us. And so in what sense could we say he's persecuting the Lord Jesus? Why would the Lord say, why are you persecuting me? And it's the simple reason that Paul was persecuting the church. He was persecuting believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the New Testament epistles will later explain that the church is the body of Christ, that he is its head. But the believers make up the body. They are the members of the body, the different parts of it, given different gifts and made to work together. You can look at this in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and also Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 1 and many other parts of the Word of God that it stressed to us the body character of the church, that believers are now made part of a spiritual organism in Christ and that he's our head, he's our authority and our leader and he guides us and empowers us by his spirit to live for him and testify for him in this world. But as Paul was persecuting these Christians, he might have thought, well, I'm doing it against these Jews, against this man, against this woman, maybe against these younger people. Who knows? We don't know exactly the ages and demographic of the people he was attacking. But it wasn't just the people. When he touched the church... The Lord Jesus saw that as him touching him. When you did it against the church, the Lord Jesus, in other words, took that personally. To persecute a Christian is to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul got the message. Uh, he would later, in the epistle to the Colossians, uh, refer this type of truth to himself and what he was suffering. And so we go over to Colossians 1 for a cross-reference. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Pardon me, <clears throat> Colossians 1 and verse 24. And there Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So Paul was saying, here I am suffering. And why am I suffering? Well, I'm suffering on behalf of Christ and his church. It's really that as I suffer, I'm not suffering because I'm Paul, I'm not suffering for my personality or for what I've personally done. I am suffering because of my identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord had told the disciples on earth before he went to the cross that this would happen. That if they followed him, they'd have to deny themselves and take up their cross. 
In Matthew 16, for instance, he says that. Or in Luke 15, he tells them that if people had received his word, they'd receive the apostles also. But if they rejected him and his word, so they'd reject the apostles and persecute them. And he goes on to say that their, their persecution would actually come from the synagogue in John 16. So now he was on the other side of this. He was living out the sufferings where he was suffering for the sake of the gospel. And he calls his afflictions the afflictions of Christ. It's because of his identification with Christ. Now, of course, these aren't redemptive sufferings. He wasn't suffering to pay for his own sins nor for the sins of anybody else. That's entirely foreign to this context. And the New Testament makes it plain. Only the Lord Jesus could suffer and pay for sins. But the Lord was suffering persecution for the sake of the body of Christ and for the sake of the Lord. As Paul suffered these persecutions, God used those things to help the church grow. Both numerically, as people saw Paul suffering, they said there must be something to this Christianity thing, and they believed on Christ. Or the letters he wrote from prison to build up the church. Or the way he encouraged other suffering believers to go on for the Lord and has through the ages. So he realized his sufferings weren't meaningless. All the troubles he went through, and particularly the persecutions he endured, he was enduring for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and his body, the church. So this was something he learned in Acts uh, chapter 9 originally when he was converted on the first day of his salvation. And it's something he kept in mind and would occasionally refer to in his writings, as we saw back there in Colossians 1. Uh, but we'll continue to unpack his testimony in the next study. Thank you for listening.